two critical uh, episodes in a pig's life, and that's immediately after they have been born and then after weaning. And uh, what uh, kind of triggered me uh, in my research was that, okay, but, but the, the newly born piglet is really deficient from, um, from uh, energy, uh, fat depots, but also from, uh, from having uh, fat-soluble vitamins. Um, this is not provided uh, via the sow. Uh, when uh, they are still um, in the uterus. So that's why immediately after birth, we need to transfer these substances um, very efficiently from the sow to the piglet. And, uh, and the other thing is that uh, piglets are also born immune deficient. So again, with the colostrum, uh, they will get a lot of uh, these uh, antibodies, uh, which is so important uh, in order to um, to actually meet with uh, the new life, which is now uh, being a, a suckling piglet. And then uh, the same thing, which is also a big challenge, that is uh, immediately after weaning, or it's not immediately after, it's actually a period of, of time which lasts for two to three uh, weeks, but it can actually also extend to, to more weeks. And this is when the piglet is um, going from uh, milk, from the sow milk, and then into solid feed, which is now a totally other composition. Swallet. Hi, and welcome to our latest edition of Swine It Podcast. I'm Jerry Purvis, your host, and today we have a special guest for you, uh, Dr. Charlotte Lawrenson. Uh, Dr. Lawrenson uh, is a professor at the University of Iris. I probably butchered that pretty bad, but uh, in the Department of Animal and Veterinary Science. And she's also the head and coordinator of Pig Paradigm. Uh, so, Dr. Lawrenson, welcome to our podcast today. Thank you very much. Yeah, and so uh, I guess uh, as we get started here, uh, maybe first let's just maybe tell tell viewers a little something about uh, your pathway to where you are today. Yeah, so um, I've been working uh, for many years um, as at the Aarhus University, and the research I've been doing is related to uh, nutritional immunology, which is also the, the title of uh, my professorship. And um, so I have been specifically interested in um, the function of uh, lipids and lipid-soluble vitamins, antioxidants, fatty acids, and other bioactive uh, substances. And then, I've been specifically interested in how uh, they influence uh, the immune uh, system of pigs and uh, also what, what can we do in order to improve the health of, uh, of pigs. And then when I talk about pigs, it's both you know, the newly uh, born piglets and also um, the piglets which are uh, weaned from, uh, from the dam. And uh, you know that uh, kind of uh, two critical uh, episodes in a pig's life, and that's immediately after they have been born and then after weaning. And uh, what uh, kind of triggered me uh, in my research was that, okay, but, but the, the newly born piglet is really deficient from, um, from uh, energy, uh, fat depots, but also from, uh, from having uh, fat-soluble vitamins. Um, this is not provided uh, via the sow uh, when uh, they are still um, in the uterus. So that's why immediately after birth, 
we need to transfer these substances um, very efficiently from the sow to the piglet. And the, and the other thing is that uh, piglets are also born immune deficient. So again, with the colostrum, uh, they will get a lot of uh, these uh, antibodies, uh, which is so important uh, in order to, um, to actually meet with uh, the new life, which is now uh, being a, a suckling piglet. And then uh, the same thing, which is also a big challenge, that is uh, immediately after weaning, or it's not immediately after, it's actually a period of, of time which lasts for two to three uh, weeks, but it can actually also extend to, to more weeks. And this is when the piglet is um, going from uh, milk, from the sow milk, and then into solid feed, which is now a totally other composition. And uh, this is mainly plant-derived substances. And that the piglet is not mature enough for actually taking up, absorb these uh, nutrients. And also, you know, they are often uh, brought into new uh, uh, environments. They are coming to a new uh, pen or new barn. And uh, this is also why the piglet is uh, extremely vulnerable uh, and, and it's difficult to suddenly cope with this uh, shift in, in diets. But the, also the other thing is that um, the immune system of piglets is not yet matured. So often we say that, okay, uh, a piglet's immune system would be mature maybe after eight weeks uh, but we we piglets yeah i know here in denmark it's after three and a half week in uh, in us it can be uh, also even earlier on maybe two weeks so it means that we have a very uh, immature uh, piglet and um, and this is putting a lot of challenge on uh, the pigs. Also, when we talk about what is actually driving the, um, uh, the immune system, how do we mature the immune system? This is also performed via the microbes, which are now in the, the gut of, of piglets. And since you know that <clears throat> Uh, the pigs we are having today, they are born from uh, sows, which are genetically uh, developed to give a lot of pigs. And uh, a, a litter can actually be up to maybe around 20 piglets. So it means that the whole farrowing process is uh, can last for a long time. It means that the last piglets, they are often born a long time after the first piglet was born. And it means that suddenly you have a, a time challenge because the last piglet may not get as much colostrum as the first pig. It can also be that uh, there's already something going on regarding um, the, 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 the microbiome of the gut. I mean, challenges which uh, in a natural environment will be often very different from uh, the way we house uh, piglets today. So you can say the next big challenge we are putting on uh, the microbiome of the gut in a piglet, that's again uh, after weaning because it influences um, the microbiome a lot when we start to, to now feed uh, this solid feed based on plant uh, substances because this changed uh, the microbiome of the gut uh, immediately and, and it's a really a big change. So my research uh, has really been oriented towards how can we actually influence uh, the gut health of piglets 
uh, in order to cope with these changes. So it has been focused on the transfer of um, of uh, uh, various uh, substances, now mainly uh, fatty acids and fat-soluble vitamins, from the sow to the piglet via colostrum and milk, and also what can we do after weaning in order to influence um, the piglets via the weaner diet. But I may also say that um, after having done a lot of research now for, for many years, I also realized that, uh, okay, we really need to, to dig much more into the complexity of uh, these things because um, it is extremely complex when you combine, you know, the microbiome in the gut with the diet which is coming <laughs> to the, 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 the piglets via either the sour milk or uh, the, the, the feed after weaning. And then again, uh, how can uh, the pig, now the individual pig, is it ready to cope with what is provided or is it actually already before uh, birth? Are there any um, specific challenges which actually influence if it's ready to cope with the changes? And the fact is today that we realize that an extremely huge variation within a litter of piglets. Uh, it's not only, you know, the birth weight, but again, it's also the time of being born, whether it's the first or the last piglet and so forth. And sometimes it matters a lot, these um, initial events. They can actually last for, for a long time. And this is what we would like to dig more into uh, what is actually the host now, the piglet responses on, you know, microbiome changes and also uh, dietary changes and how can we actually uh, influence a lot of um, the various um, uh, uh, biological responses we can measure on a pig. Yeah, so this is... Uh, uh, briefly how um, or just to describe my research interests yeah Eastman serves veterinarians and nutritionists in agrochemical and animal health industries by helping them select evaluate and implement innovative nutritional programs Eastman works with your team to customize your gut health approach in feed and water Eastman's approach addresses nutritional and bacterial challenges and finds new ingredient preservation and hygiene solutions Explore ways to accelerate and innovate your programs. Contact the Animal Nutrition Team at Eastman.com. Yeah, it, you know, it's uh, very interesting. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, just in summary, a lot of these stressors that these pigs uh, have all come at one time, it seems, you know, uh, whether it's nutritional strat uh, stresses, environment, social stresses, uh, immunological stresses uh and so it, it's it's a daunting task how we even how this pig even survives and then you mentioned colostrum you know pigs uh now we've got more prolific litters we've got the farrowing duration has got more extended so we got pigs that are have hypoxia and maybe not getting enough colostrum uh so they're they've got you know they're behind the eight ball to start with uh even as they're born so so very good. It's it's. Uh, I think it's a, a very pertinent because uh, we all deal with with uh, scours with diarrhea, and uh, and you you know just talking a minute. Um, you you're you're coordinator of a pretty important project. Maybe I want to talk a little bit about uh, the import the pig paradigm project and uh, how that uh, what that is. Uh, maybe speak a little bit uh, what the goals of that project has been. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the ultimate goal for our project PIC paradigm is also to, um, to make, uh, to have antimicrobial treatments for both human and, and animals 
in uh, 2030, for instance, or even longer. The problem now is that uh, like WHO, they have actually proclaimed that in 2050, a antimicrobial resistance will be the third um, reason for death uh, globally. And this means, uh, so, so what are the countries who are really experiencing um, uh, such an AMR crisis now? They do see it, of course, in, again, in uh, poor countries and uh, uh, countries where they have difficulties uh, with health treatments and so forth. Um, and, and I think, uh, again, when we take it, uh, what is really the, the, the human uh, global ch- challenge, that is AMR. And this is why we actually came into a pig paradigm. Because, again, we are also having a lot of uh, focus on... Um, on the pig production here. And the reason is that, uh, at least in Denmark, uh, if you now consider what is the antimicrobial usage in Denmark uh, when it comes to livestock production, and the majority is really in the pig production. And now when we narrow it down, we can see that the majority of the antimicrobial usage um, in, in the pig production, antibiotics use, that's for treatment of uh, the weaners because they are suffering a lot from gastrointestinal uh, diseases. So what is observed is really diarrhea outbreaks in the pig herds. So that's why we can see that, okay, we are having a, a major challenge with uh, antibiotic usage in the pig production in Denmark as well as in other countries. It depends, of, of course, on uh, the certain or specific livestock production in the given country. But um, in, in the, our pig paradigm project, we are uh, four countries. No, we are uh, three countries, uh, but four, five partners, um, and that is uh, Holland and the and, uh, US and Denmark. And again, uh, also in Holland, they are having uh, the same problems as well as in US. But our pig paradigm project is a global initiative. So what we learn in pig paradigm, it's important that, you know, we are bringing the results out to uh, the global uh, audience, and this we will do. So, um, yeah. So, so this is what it, what peak paradigm is about. The ultimate goal is really to reduce uh, the mitigation of uh, antimicrobial resistance um, globally. Yeah. So, so this is even more, uh, more or less a a, a, a human help. Uh, 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 issue that we have, and not net, not just a uh, pig trying to improve pig health. It's got some really major implications. I didn't. I saw a figure that, uh, and maybe you can validate that uh, a million uh, people died worldwide uh, last year due to antibiotic resistant pathogens. Is that is that pretty accurate? Yeah, it sounds. Uh... I mean, correct, but but I I still coming in numbers. So, uh, but, but at least you know what is said by WHO is really okay. Be aware that this is a you know a, a really important uh, challenge on a longer term as well. And if we don't do anything, we will really experience a lot of. Uh, Death among humans due to AMR. Yeah, and, and Dr. Lawrence, and um, just kind of uh, talking a little bit about uh, you know in the past we've we've had uh, as a producer myself, you know, growth promoters have been uh, we've used uh, growth promoted levels of antibiotics to improve production and to control pathogens, 
And, and then you mentioned uh, Zeke, as you guys have lost uh, Zeke. We use Zeke. Zeke's pretty, uh, pretty uh, effective, especially in those early wean diets uh, at controlling the real life. So, you know, we, we're moving into an area where uh, we've relied on these antibiotics for years, and, uh, and they've been kind of a crutch. So it, it, as, as this uh, project has gotten off, what are some of the areas that uh, you've seen or been able to, to uncover that might give us some, some alternative uh, tools to use? Yeah. Uh, what we're doing in the Tinkerland project, that is really to uh, provide uh, the, the fundamental knowledge which we need to uh, develop some solutions and these will primarily be focused on uh, dietary solu- solutions and in that way alternatives to both uh, zinc oxide and also antibiotics. But we need to understand this interaction between the diet, the microbiome and the pig or the host because um, what happens, you know, both throughout the gastrointestinal tract and also when the diet is meeting the specific microbiome in a, a specific site of the gut, and also how does the host now react when uh, the microbiome and the diet is uh, meeting each other? And why do some pigs uh, why do they suffer a lot from infectious de- uh, um, diseases while a little mate may not suffer that much? So understand, you know, the host phenotype uh, in, in, in this respect. And then what we do in pig paradigm is really to link all these data we are uh, obtaining together in order to get a really good picture and really understand, you know, uh, uh, all these data and the results. And this is not done that often in in research because it's a huge project and it means that we are a lot of scientists who are working together on, uh, on this subject. And now you can say, so why is this project needed? It's needed because, you know, Yes, we gave gave up on the use of antibiotic growth promoters. In Denmark, it was already in uh, 98, uh, while uh, it was, uh, the use was banned by EU in uh, 2006. So we have, in fact, had a lot of experience for a long time on, um, on what can we do in order to replace antibiotic growth promoters. And then what came up was this the use of medical zinc. Uh, but this has been used as kind of the best alternative to the use of, of uh, antibiotics to treat uh, diarrhea in pigs. But uh, last year, uh, it was banned by the EU. And this was because zinc oxide is also creating AMR. There is a good report there. So when we start to treat with medical doses of uh, zinc oxide, it is being excreted by the pig and it ends into the soil and then uh, it is initiating uh, antimicrobial resistance. So this is why it was uh, banned. And now we are here, you know, in order to find the next, you can say, silver bullet or cocktail, we really need to understand uh, what is going on in the piglet and especially what is going on with the piglet's uh, gut microbiome. Yeah, you mentioned zinc. You know, I always thought that was kind of an environmental issue, but uh, as you're saying, it, it's just like an antibiotic. These bugs, you know, figure out when they're challenged with a molecule, they, they, they evolve and, and they mutate, they change and, and they're they're able to figure out ways around it. That's just the way they, they work. So, you know, you kept me, you kept, uh, you keep mentioning, uh, microbiome and gut health. How, uh, how does that, do those two things, are they connected and, and, uh, how do they work together to, to, uh, impact the health of that pig? So actually, um, 
Because what I didn't uh, tell you so far is that I, I was also, uh, during my research career, I have also been very interested in uh, the same challenges in uh, the human gut. And, you know, we are having some uh, severe uh, uh, diseases, inflammatory diseases in human ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, some of these um, inflammatory bowel diseases. And, you know, sometimes uh, and so what, what actually uh, induces these diseases and, and the problem is that uh, they are really, uh, uh, the number of, of new patients has increased. Why yeah, I'll get I was going to point out, it, it seems that, uh, that ha the prevalence of those diseases do seem to have gotten higher. Is that correct? There's more an increase in the population. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes, I mean, we don't really know if, if actually the microbiome of the human gut is now uh, the cause or, or, or whether it's not. I mean, it can also be that some of... Um, uh, you can say the the natural uh, bacteria in the gut uh, they they suddenly become pathogenic, and maybe this can actually induce inflammation. And the same thing may happen in the pig gut. That sometimes you know things which shouldn't be pathogenic is suddenly uh, being pathogenic. And, and so far, we know, you know, that E. coli, um, this is often inducing diarrhea in pigs. And uh, we know that 50% uh, of the diarrhea in, in newly weaned pigs, that's caused by, uh, by uh, E. coli. But you can sometimes, okay, then you can say, when is it actually uh, becoming um, inducing uh, disease and when is it sometimes something the pig can actually cope with because the problem is when the farmer is observing more than two pigs in a pen he starts to you know flock um, treating of the piglets meaning that it could be that that only one or two pigs, then you can treat them on an individual basis. But when the diarrhea problem gets too big, then the farmer starts to, to medicate the whole pen. And then maybe you also treat some pigs which did not uh, need the treatment. And this is why we really have to understand so what happens in the gut? When is it needed to actually start an, an antibiotic treatment? So there are things there where, um, again, uh, we need to understand this interface between, you know, the diet and the microbe uh, in this specific pattern. And sometimes understanding more specifically what happens when a uh, a, a natural uh, microbiome suddenly or something which should be there suddenly turns around and start actually to induce mechanisms which uh, should not be induced. And this can be, you know, uh, the host, it can be the microbiome, it can be the diet or the interaction between uh, these uh, three uh, uh, things. You know, it's, it's fascinating. As we went through COVID, I think people got to understand we know our immune system is important, and uh, but uh, our immune system can go haywire and can actually harm. So it, it can be, it, it's a very vital part of our, our, our health defense. But it also, as you said, you know, you, if you have overstimulated, you know, if you've got inflammation, that's not good either. So, it, you know, it's pretty interesting how a lot of this information you're learning from pigs directly transfers over to humans and, and understanding some of the similar issues that we're seeing today uh, in a population. Yeah, exactly. And there you can say you also started, I could see that um, 
there were a lot of suggestions on uh, how to reduce the burden during an COVID-19 infection. So this was actually also oral supplements of uh, different, uh, yeah, I think it was cocktails of vitamin C and vitamin D and, and other things which we know actually is influencing uh, the immune system, actually enhancing the immune system often in order to, to cope with infectious diseases. And yeah, I think... I think that was a good point. You know, uh, I think we also started or people started to understand that uh, nutrition, some of these things uh, can really play a part in how well our immune system or where it works and our, our microbiome uh, and keeping that microbiome uh, in a good uh, ratio of good and bad you know, bacteria, fungi. So, well, uh, and so as as you as you got into your research, uh, you mentioned uh, nutritional strategies. What are some of the things that uh, some alternative strategies that you think are promising? Uh, some of the things I think we're using today, uh, it seems, with a lot of the production has moved to, uh, you know, antibiotics were, are probably have some of the best returns as a producer. They're consistent, you know, and so as growth promoters, but. We've also made some strides, I think, with some other uh, some other uh, molecules, some other uh, tools. So maybe uh, it, do your research. What have you found? Maybe some some promising alternatives to to antibiotics. Yeah, uh, we are not that far yet in the paradigm, um, and and what we obtain from our project is is really also focused on understanding. Uh, the mechanism. It also to understand the microbiome, which is not only bacteria, it's also viri, it's, it's a lot of other things. So, you know, to get this was what I talked about, get the whole picture of what's going on. But, but having said that, okay, what in my eyes is one of the promising strategies that is actually to get started early. Very often we see in the scientific literature in older days, we could say that, okay, we wean the piglet and then we start, you know, to, to feed the big piglet uh, some different uh, dietary treatments. But the time at that point may not be there to actually make any change. So when it comes to, and this leads me back to uh, what is my topic here in the nutritional immunology, then it's also about thinking which, when should I, uh, when is prime time? I mean, when should we start to, to actually manipulate with the, the immune system? And I think it's important to, to, uh, uh, to to be started to get the started early, meaning why the piglet is still uh, probably suckling the the sow, and then you can think about what can we do uh, in that period of time, and uh, this could be either via the sow milk, but it can also be milk supplements, and it can of course also be via the creep feed. Uh, so, so, but, but I think this is an, an important uh, uh, thing, take home message. Yeah. So, so what? Yeah. Do, do you think there's some, even some maybe interventions we can do in utero that might, uh, is, is that pig uh, through the sow? So maybe some interventions to the sow in, in, in gestation. I think, unfortunately, it's difficult often with uh, the pig or the sow utero. Uh, because um, so I have also worked with uh, with broilers, you know, and there they are more into this in ovo uh, nutritional strategies in order to influence the immune system of the newly hatched bird. But we do not have the same uh, um, possibilities, I think, for pigs. But what we could now think about that is. Um, so we are running in, in, in the pig paradigm, we are running a huge cohort study consisting of uh, many sows and piglets. 
And what we really want to understand, that's this variation between piglets. So you can say, uh, if we start to, to uh, sample immediately when they are born and then uh, up to when they are 10 weeks of age, so that we actually obtain data for the individual piglets uh, during these uh, 10 weeks. And this can actually uh, enable us to understand the development of these uh, host responses, both when it comes to you know, uh, immune responses, but also other biomarkers of uh, biological uh, 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 mechanisms. And then um, in order to do this, you can say on a longer term, it may be that you will come with one set of nutritional strategies for a specific uh, group of piglets. This could be, could it be uh, piglets which are born with low birth weight or having uh, little colostrum. And then another group where you have uh, large piglets um, and they are capable in in, in actually uh, cope with other nutritional strategies. So I think this is kind of my expectations to, to uh, some of the things we are doing in Peak Paradigm. The other thing we are also doing is to make very intensive studies with piglets where we do try to really uh, dig into various sites of uh, the gastrointestinal tract to understand when we, you know, start to make a dietary intervention, what happens uh, with this diet at the specific site of the, or segment of the, the, the gut and at which time, you know. So, so this is also another aspect here. So it's a, it seems like uh, you're saying, uh, you know, understanding the variation we have with pigs and being able to, to understand what's, what's going on there and how we can uh, use strategies with precision to, to impact where they're needed. Uh, you know, that's a big, uh, birth weight is a big predictor of survivability. What do you think uh, is, is going on with those pigs that, uh, that predisposes them uh, to, to uh, poor survivability? Uh, what what are some of the what do you think are some of the reasons why you know a, a really light birth weight pig uh, is is it and is this a problem you know geneticists now we've got more pigs we've got more litter our litter size is increasing uh, so we you know maybe it, do we need to rethink maybe uh, where we've got too many pigs you know and uh, some of those nutrients some of those things are being divided across the, the pie is getting smaller I guess so to speak. Uh, what were your thoughts there? Um, yeah, well, my uh, some of my re uh, research, not related to peak paradigm, but what I have done um, uh, in another project uh, financed by the Danish Ministry of Food and Agriculture, there we have actually really observed the. The, the importance of the colostrum intake. I mean, this is simply extremely important. And another thing, you, you mentioned that yourself, hypoxia, uh, also, you know, that sometimes, okay, if uh, the farrowing process is taking too long time, this can also create a, really a burden on the newly born pig. And, and of course, uh, then uh, an increased risk of uh, death in the newly born piglets. Uh, the other thing now is um, uh, after weaning. And, you know, um, how can we actually prevent mortality after weaning? And this is, again, I think, to... Uh, really be able to control some of the mechanisms I'm dealing a lot with not only inflammation but also oxidative stress and you know 
if uh, oxidative stress reactions are getting out of control, and this is the same with inflammation, if it, such processes are getting out of control, uh, it can actually increase the risk of, uh, of death uh, of, of uh, the piglets. And, and this can happen very fast also. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. You know, uh, you mentioned oxidative stress. Uh, what are some? I know we we we've talked about nutritional immunity, and uh, you know some 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 areas of nutritionally vitamins, lipids, fatty acids, and antioxidants. So uh, maybe maybe just for a minute, just uh, talk. What are some of those? <clears throat> how are those those products maybe gonna gonna help? Uh, control this, like I said, inflammation and oxidative stress. Yeah. So we are, um, again, we are trying to understand uh, some of these products or antioxidants. Uh, some of them we would like uh, to be absorbed by the piglet in order to also have an effect systemically. And then you can argue some of the um, of the typical antioxidants, they have a very low uh, bioavailability. Some of them are not really being absorbed by the animal. They are just being getting out again. But maybe they do have an impact on, um, on oxidative stress, which does appear in the gut as well. So the fact is that, you know, we, we know that in order to cope with an invading uh, pathogenic bacteria, uh, we do see host responses. I mean, oxidative stress, it is necessary in order to actually kill the bugs in the, in the gut. But the problem is, again, if we cannot control what happens afterwards, it can actually destroy uh, the gut epithelium. And when we destroy the gut epithelium, it cannot absorb any nutrients. So again, we need to have a very well-balanced uh, mechanism here in the gut in order to say, okay, uh, the piglet needs to actually kill the bugs, but we also need to make sure that it doesn't get out of control. And this is sometimes what we do see in some of these uh, 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 alerting uh, human diseases as well when it gets chronic diseases yeah yeah i think that, that goes right along with with humans uh you know uh we, we got to have a good immune system and but we don't want to hype you want we don't want it activated all the time either uh and so that's uh that's a, an area i think uh it, it seems really there's a lot of focus and a lot of attention today and uh, and so it seems like what you're saying is, um, you know, instead of we, we had antibiotics, we, we, we kind of uh, post tried to deal with the pathogens that are there, destroy the pathogens, the antimicrobials. But, uh, but here we're, we're more or less supporting that pig's ability to, to function uh, with these pathogens, improving that microbiome. So, you know, the competitive exclusion, we've got, we've got better, good bacteria there, and we've got less incidences uh, for that immune system to respond, but also supporting that pigs. Uh, so when it does have a challenge, that pig is able to, to mount a, a quick and potent response uh, to that challenge. And, and the other thing, in addition to that, it's not only the pig's response, but it's also can be, we, uh, via the diet, manipulate the microbiome to function in a strategic way, you can say. So this is why pig paradigm is so uh, focused on the pig microbiome because we really want to understand uh, what is it doing, what can we do, how does, what is the communication between um, the microbiomes from uh, throughout the gastrointestinal tract. And how do we link all these data together in order to get uh, kind of the whole picture on uh, what's going on? Um, and this balance between being healthy or deceased or having diarrhea or no diarrhea. So, so this is really uh, um, what is uh, uh, the major focus points in our, our project. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, that, and that's the essence of, of the, the, the name paradigm because it's a shift. You know, now it looks like instead of, to give an analogy, we've got, a, we've got a, an army that we're going to fight the enemy, but now we're, we're more or less, we're not working on, we're not focusing on the army. We're focusing more on the fort and the, the, the abilities to keep, to keep out um, pathogens. And without using, you know, as, as you said, without using antibiotics as a, as a tool. And um, so very good. And I think, you know, from our, based on our research now, we can also extrapolate a lot to other animal species and also even the human. So, so we are really um, uh, trying to to make the best use out of our results and also other contexts. So, yeah. Yeah. So these resources that are that you the that you're using is is going to be is going to be really a good investment, as you said, as it uh, applies to other. Same the same. You know, a lot of these animals species are, are pretty similar. You know, so some of the what knowledge that you learn will be will trans, transcend species and and even even the humans. So pretty uh, pretty important. And then of course, uh, yeah, again, we are a lot of uh, scientists working on this, and uh, we are uh, doing a lot of nice uh, research together. So uh, yeah, you can look into our different uh, media channels, uh, homepage, and uh, other things to, to learn more about it, yeah. So you, so you think there's still a lot of room for, for, not, for learning and uh, you haven't reached uh, where, you, where, you, where you guys have figured it out yet? There's still um, a vast opportunity for more knowledge in this area. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I think this is uh, it's a great opportunity. And... Uh, we will really try to, to do our best in order to uh, fulfill what we have described in our project to, um, to actually ultimately, as I said, come up with uh, alternatives to antibiotics and zinc oxide and also to uh, also meet with the ultimate goal again to reduce antibiotics Crocodile resistance, and, uh, and this is now in order also to be sure that there will be the right antibiotic treatments for both human and uh, and animals on a longer term. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a pretty much a life and death uh, project you got here. I mean, it's about saving lives and uh, and uh, every year. Uh, so. Uh, you know, it, it, it's amazing to me the complexity of these responses and in, in the in the biological responses here that they work together and and, and how they interact and and uh, very tough to to understand and, and just take out one piece. There's so many things that are uh, signaling other uh, parts and and how they interact and and I guess that's the that's the knowledge that uh, you you guys are seeking and uh, it, it's it's. Uh, the, the, there's a lot more to be learned for sure. It's time for our famous three. Want to improve feed biosecurity? VVC Premix from DSM Firminiche can reduce pathogen concentration of feed with proven results against ASF, PED, PRRS, and SVA. VVC Premix can also help improve gut functionality, weight gain, and feed efficiency. Learn more at dsm.com forward slash vvc dash premix. Well, our, our, our time's drawing nigh, and uh, we always uh, ask our guests three questions. Uh, first question What is your favorite resource uh, that you use? Uh, but that's uh, to work with uh, the young scientists. I've had that said a lot of times, and uh, I never thought about that. But that's true. You know, they they keep us young, and uh, and their young minds are, are uh, the technology that they know, that they bring with them that, uh, that I didn't have. So it's uh, yeah, that's a good. I've, I've heard that a lot. And who who would you say would would maybe your most influential person uh, throughout your career? Yeah, I mean. Uh... 
maybe not the most influencing person, but you know, I in fact did a um, sabbatical at the Linus Pauling Institute, and you know, Linus Pauling, and he was a person who actually uh, found vitamin C, and um, and 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 uh, I worked a lot with with the the people there at this institute, and it was kind of uh, influencing. Um, why I, I I actually decided to uh, dedicate my research to uh, nutrition and um, and health and and uh, of of both uh, human and uh, now pigs. So so you know vitamin E is really my uh, favorite subject. I worked a lot with uh, Professor Marit Treba at the Linus Pauling Institute. And, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I have really obtained a lot of inspiration uh, when I was, uh, was young. Uh, yeah. So it paid also my uh, career. Yeah. 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 It's amazing how people can, uh, can put you on, on, on your pathway sometimes. Uh, just, mm-hmm. They're just witnessing their, their uh, passion for what they do and, and the, Creates a passion for you, yeah, very good. And I think it's important today, to, you know. And I mean, to become a scientist, you you really have to have a passion for the things you are doing. Yeah, that, I think that leads into your la- our last question. What uh, what are the traits you're in research? So what what are you think are the key traits of successful people, successful researchers, that like yourself? You have to think about uh, your mission. I mean, is there a mission with your research? You have to have the passion for what you are doing. Uh, and, and of course, you also have to uh, believe that you can make a difference in, in the, with the research you are doing. Yeah, so that, that gets you up every morning, you know, and keeps you going, knowing that, uh, you know, there is a purpose to what you're doing and, uh, and uh and a passion for what you're doing. That's really important, you know, and, and uh, because we can also talk about funding and we could talk about the uh, infrastructure and being the right uh, place at the right time and things like this. But ultimately, I think that uh, on an individual level that you you have these other things, passion, uh, want to desire to do a different job. Yeah. Well, I can tell you really have a passion for, for your work, and uh, it, it's awesome work. I think, it, as you said, you know, we started the show off. Uh, the whole goal is, is to try to reduce uh, antibiotics and uh, find strategies and reduce the, the incidences of, of antibiotic resistances that we're seeing and, and uh, understanding. So, so it's, it's a very pertinent, uh, very profitable work, and uh, I appreciate uh work you're doing it, 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 it directly affects you know who would have thought uh we, we i'm a producer and we don't use antibiotics uh in any any of our uh our feed and uh, who would have thought that i would be able to say that today i would have never thought 20 years ago that i could i even thought of it but it but it, it's just uh you know shout out to, to people like yourself that uh, are out there you know, understanding, understanding these things and, and giving us uh, knowledge that we were able to use. And, uh, you know, there's no problem we can't fix. And it's, it's just uh, we got to put all our heads together and, and go to go to work. And so, so yeah, I, I really, as a producer, you know, uh, I think it's uh, it's a very worthy uh, goal that you're doing. And, and this pig paradigm is, a, is an awesome project. So I look forward to seeing what's going to happen down the road. I'm sure there'll be uh, more and more knowledge and, and we'll learn more and more as, as the years go by. So I enjoyed you being on our show and uh, look forward to uh, seeing more good things coming out of your, your project. So, all right. Well, you have a, you have a good day. The same to you.